Okay, it says live on Facebook now. Yeah. I think we are live. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to our latest session of uh, Ideas Conclave. We have a brilliant panel here with us today. Uh, the session today uh, will be moderated by Mina Malik Hussain, who is a writer, a poet. Uh, she is she used to write a column for the nation and has also taught at LAMS. She is currently uh, doing her MST in creative writing from the University of Oxford. Uh, and we're delighted to have uh, Ms. Moni Mohsen, who is an acclaimed author. And her latest book has just come out in December. It's not unfortunately available in Pakistan right now, but will be. Uh, from what I gather very soon. Uh, 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 apart from write, uh, being a novelist, uh, she her writings have appeared in many internationally renowned newspapers, including The Guardian, The Prospect, and The Nation. So uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, taking out the time. And thank you so much, Pina, for doing this. Over to you guys now. Thank you, Raza, for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And... Um... Yes, so sort of let's let's dive right in. So Moni, I feel like you are best known and best loved for being a satirist and the way that you have over the years with your column, Diary of a Social Butterfly and the books that came out of the column and the character herself. And now you do these wonderful um, little Instagram videos with Butterfly, who's really now been given a literal voice and not just one on the page. So tell me, what do you enjoy most about writing Butterfly and performing her now? Um, thank you, Mina. Thank you, Raza, for inviting me. Thank you for um, hosting me. Um, and uh, since it's still January, I'd like to say a Happy New Year. Um, <laughs> as we discussed earlier, um, it's kosher to keep on saying Happy New Year to the end of January. So here we are. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope it will be a happy and safe and, and, and um, healthy New Year. Um, in, fingers crossed. Um, with regard to my writing, uh, the question was, what do I enjoy most? Uh, yeah. I, I um, Mina, there are two things that I like very much about writing The Butterfly. Uh, one is the, um, the language. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the fact that we speak in a slightly different way, uh, our uh, Desi Urdu uh, or Desi English is, is um, our own. We've made it our own. We have changed it and we have given it a new kind of edge uh, in Pakistan. Um, and I like when I, when I write as a, um, as a novelist, um, I am attuned to the way people speak because I want to get that truth down. I think if you are, um, uh, if you are writing about um, the subcontinent, then to my mind, you also have to write about the way people speak. Sometimes it becomes a bit complicated because people are speaking in both Urdu and Punjabi or Sindhi or whatever, and you have to convey that. And that becomes uh, problematic. But um, the other thing, but I do enjoy the language hugely. Um, I also enjoy very much the observations. So a lot of the things would have passed me by as well, but for the fact that I have to, um, I have to uh, notice them and I have to remember them for the butterfly. Mm -hmm. and, and that has made me very conscious and very aware of so much um, cultural, um, uh, how should I say this? Um, Mm, particularity, you know, mm, mm. Um, and so, and uh, it makes me... that people use language idiomatically, and you can tell a lot about somebody from the way they speak or the way that they use vocabulary. Is that what you mean? No, that too, and also how so much of it is freighted uh, because of our culture. Mm. You know, uh, so much of the culture comes through in the language. You know, they say the key is that the, uh, the, uh, the lang language is always a key to deciphering a culture. And, um, uh, you know, like for instance, um, when we speak, um, there is a, there's a, a term, um, and I, because I studied anthropology at university, social wow. anthropology, so that training sort of kicks in when I'm listening, watching and observing. So there is this concept of rakhakhao in Urdu, yes. 
you know, mm-hmm. and in the culture, it's not just a linguistic thing, it's a cultural thing, you know, yes. that cow and what it means and how you must comport yourself, how you must uh, be, um, how you must behave. Um, yes. And that's very important, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so for instance, those ideas of rakrakhau will play into how you attend a funeral, for example, you know, mm-hmm. or how you will receive guests at a wedding, because there is certain formality and a certain um, uh, lena dena which has to be observed. Yes. Uh, so and, and those things uh, are very particular to our culture and I enjoy observing them very much. So how do you find, um, because Butterfly has come together in the shape of two books, but you have also written a novel in the traditional sense of a novel. Do you find it challenging? What are the challenges of writing, let's say, a weekly column like Butterfly versus mm-hmm. something that's much more long form? Is it difficult to kind of switch between? So, Mina, I actually started um, as a journalist and a columnist. So, a Diary of a Social Butterfly, I started writing for the Friday Times many, 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 many years ago, uh, in the 90s, in fact. Mm. And um, the my first novel didn't come out until 2006. Uh, yeah. That was the... Um, it was called The End of Innocence. And that was a, uh, a standalone novel. It had nothing to do with the columns. Mm-hmm. And then the columns, I continued writing the columns while I was writing the novel. It took five years to write it because I had two small children in that time. I gave birth to them and brought them up and all of that. Um, and then uh, I wrote another novel called Tender Hooks, which is a, um, a continuation of the columns, but it is actually a novel, a standalone novel on itself as well. Yes. And mm-hmm. now, uh, uh, Ruby and um, the, the impeccable integrity of Ruby R. So this is actually my third novel, um, but the second one, which is not about butterfly. It's um, um, the process is of, of writing the column is slightly different because you have to react to what has happened in in Pakistan that week or in the world that week. It has to be um, it has to be timely. It has to be relevant. Sometimes, of course, I make things up, you know. So, for example, uh, I will make up a story about somebody uh, who because if it's been a slow week and there's nothing to report, etc. Mm-hmm. I'll make up a story of a um, woman who's given birth and who's got, you know, she's got this newborn baby and the father in law is insisting that he's going to name the child. Yes. And and you know, um, or because Daddy G is the one who has all the money, and you have to waiting to inherit from Daddy G. You can't upset Daddy G also, yeah. but at the same time, you want to have you know name the child yourself. So all of those problems. So I do those as well. Um, but um, <laughs> even those are um, you know, um, I think are contemporary issues. So yes. if, even if I'm not writing about politics, it has to be contemporary. A novel is not like that. You can choose, you know, so uh, The End of Innocence was um, based in 1971. Uh, that yes. is where it was located. So it is a different kind of rhythm. It has a different kind of feel to it. Mm-hmm. So how is, one thing that I really enjoyed and I've been reading the columns for so long and then I read Tender Hoax and the, you know, the compilation of the columns. And I personally really enjoyed how Butterfly as a character has evolved over time. <coughs> so as a writer, and I'm sure there are lots of writers who are sort of listening to us right now, it takes a great deal of commitment, I imagine, to stick with one character for this long and to kind of see her grow. So do you feel like, you know, a lot of writers say that sometimes the character takes on a life of its own. Mm-hmm. And do you feel like Butterfly has done that for you? Yes. So, you know, right from the start, she, once you find, for me, certainly as a writer, once you find the you have to get into a character. There has to be a way in. And, and for me, always the way in is the language. Hmm. Once I understand how this person is going to speak, then I understand their worldview. Huh. And butterflies, I access through that. Uh, she has changed Mina a little bit, but she hasn't changed all that much. <laughs> so she hasn't, she hasn't really grown as a human being so much because she doesn't learn too much. Right. Occasionally she learn a little bit, but she doesn't learn too much. And we know lots of people who value exactly the same things uh, at the age of 60 as they did at 20. You know, I know so many young women uh, who started, I, I knew of them who began 
you know, who, who still love designer Joda and still love mm. handbag with the same passion that they did when mm. they were they were 20. And they're now in their 50s. You know, yeah. the idea of, for example, of um, what constitutes a good rishta yes. is still what it was when they were 20 to now what it is, you know, and what constitutes mm. happiness also. Mm. You mm. know, okay, a chief family ka admi ho. Huh, that, 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 that. There's no idea of personal uh, compatibility. Hmm, hmm. Because so, again, the, the ultimate aim is not personal happiness. It's fitting into a milieu. It's passing on the same kind of status quo for better or for worse. Absolutely. It's, absolutely. It's, it's almost dynastic, a kind of dynastic social system where you just want to preserve it at all costs. And, so, and the class structure, you know, that you yes. marry amongst yourselves, that cousins marry each other, you know. Uh, and that um, you perpetuate, as you say, the same sort of, mm. the same class structure, very rigid, keep power in your hands. Mm -hmm. And that is also sort of what I'm also curious about for Sata. And I feel like uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why, for example, Butterfly is such an enduring and well-loved across the board character, is that you are able to bring this, um, I don't want to say edgy because you know, it makes you sound like Blade Runner or something like woo, like you know, writing ninja. You can say edgy, yeah, it's so fine. You can say edge. So because I feel like with satire, it's not just humor. It is a humor that is based on social observation. It and it's based on a, a very keen sense of, like you said, class and and language and the kind of systems that one wants to keep perpetuating and the interests one wants to protect and that sense of a legacy being passed down and things. And I feel like it's a genre that people in at least Pakistani writers in English have not really gone towards in terms of the writing. And I, and I wonder why that is, because I personally think it's a balance that's very hard to find and you are able mm. empathy and humor and, and analysis. Um. Mina, I think uh, satire is slightly different to humor in that it has an agenda. Yes. You know, the agenda is to try and change things, to show people the ridiculousness of life, you know, the, uh, to make them, to hold up a mirror and say, you know, this is how weird it is. And this is how sometimes unbecoming it is. And when people, the idea is that when people will see it, they will, uh, they will, understand and hopefully change, but I don't think change is, is that easy. Um, and uh, But I would disagree with you on one thing. I think that um, there is a writer uh, who writes in English and is a great satirist, and that is Mohammed Hanif. Um, yes. He is brilliant. He writes political satire. Also, his columns are very satirical. Um, yes. You know, his, his journalism is satirical. Um, his, his novels have also employed satire. Um, and, uh, you know, he writes about also, uh, you know, um, Alice Bhatti, his novel, uh, mm -hmm. was actually about the injustice that is meted out to minorities. Yes. Um, and, and it held up again, uh, a mirror uh, to the readership. Quite right. but again, very funny as well. No, he is. I completely agree. But it's again, it's a minority. Do you feel like it's a cultural um, jijak also ki log mind karenge agar maine likha? No, actually, Mina, I think, you know, what it is, is that if you want to be published in the West, you also have to write about the sort of themes that they want to publish. So they are very uh, interested in, in um, what they call weighty themes, you know? So books yes. about, so for um, the subcontinent, in fact, um, uh, an editor very recently sat me down from a very big publishing house and said to me that we are not interested in humor from the subcontinent, quite frankly. Uh, what we are interested in are big, sort of weighty, difficult, hard, themes engaged with very deeply and engaged with very seriously and so you know they want from us books on terrorism they want uh, from uh, us books on so from india in indian uh, publish if, when they're publishing books in from uh, india they will write they'll want to know about caste they will mm. want to know about uh, our 
you know, uh, uh, how Islam intersects with our daily lives, how Muslims make yeah. sense of the world, you know, as if yeah. we are completely other kind of thing. And um, poverty and slums mm -hmm. and our corrupt politics, those are the things that they want to hear from us, you know. So I, I was reading a, uh, an article by a uh, black writer who'd written that <clears throat> in, uh, if you are African, um, you have to write about either AIDS or poverty or corruption. Mm -hmm. You are not allowed to tell the story of a hip young, um, let's say DJ working in a city like Lagos. Um, mm -hmm. You have to write about race if you are, and we have to explain things to the West. It's our job to educate them. We cannot be, you know, frivolous mm -hmm. or fun or because, you know, and if we do give books like that, they don't want to publish them. So that is why maybe maybe our writers, you know, from the subcontinent. And if you look at the books that are published from the subcontinent, by and large, they are those kind of sort of serious books. Maybe yes. the writers themselves also want to write those, and I'm sure they do. And they engage with them very well, I think, and, and do great justice to those mm -hmm. ideas. But the West is not open to other things. So maybe that plays a role in it. I don't know. And at this mm -hmm. point, may I just quickly say to you that yes. we are doing a podcast a friend of mine and i i was about to say but very good yes tell us more I, about the podcast so the podcast is called browned off and <laughs> it is <laughs> <a> onions. <laughs> and browned off actually in english means you know when you're sort of cheesed off about something upset mm -hmm. about something and um so my um fellow podcaster is faiza sultan khan and she is an editor and a critic and uh we both talk about um how diversity is um um projected um yeah. and dealt with in western culture uh, so we talk about films we talk about mo movies sorry movies films tv books food fashion uh, all of yeah. that uh, and it's going to be launched on the 15th yes which is tomorrow which is tomorrow yes <laughs> indeed round off please do listen yes something to look forward to and because i have the pri privilege of being friends with both faiza and moni i can promise you that it is going to be hilarious and you will love it so you know, it's something, I hope something, so. I hope you'll find a, it. A New Year's gift. Thanks very much. <laughs> but this is also in the UK. There is that term which is BAME, isn't it? And I, I, yeah. I and I know that it is the bane of many a, a brown writers. Yeah, I sometimes think that you know that the L is missing from it, um, <laughs> um, and it it means black, uh, Asian, uh, ethnic minority, something like. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even like it. I think it's horrible. I just call them non-white mm -hmm. rather than, you know, or people of color. Um, and yeah, you know, ever since Black Lives Matter, they're all scrambling now to show, to prove that they are really uh, open to new ideas and open to, because they've discovered, particularly in the publishing industry, that mm -hmm. only 13% of um, the of publishers, editors, etc., in in Britain are non-white. Most of them are white. Most of them uh, only um, project sort of Western stories, or if they are sort of stories about non-white people, then they have to be about race. They have to be, you know, so there's this kind of agenda, um, and. Uh, people of color have been protesting about that because it doesn't allow you, therefore, to be a person in, in your own right, in the sense you're only there. So, for example, if I want to write a story about um, a murder, you know, uh, which is which has nothing to do with, with class or with mm. uh, religion or with... Um, or someone's or dreadful husband or, you know... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, women are always... For BAME communities, women are always seen in a particular way, particularly with mm -hmm. Asians. They're always victims. We always have to be victims because mm -hmm. that's how they see us. Um, so we've, we've been protesting against that and said, you know, why can't we write humor? Why can't we write sci-fi? Why can't we write um, uh, whodunits? Why can't we write yeah. fantasy? Why can't we write horror? Why must we always have to write about race? Um, and that, that is something which has been sort of uh, writers have been protesting about here. Which um, is great and, because it's so stifling to have to, in a way, be forced to essentialize your own self. So yeah. you can never, I remember Faiza talking about this and saying you can never just eat a burger. Yeah. 
No, it you has can't. to be a parameter of you a can't. CD. And it has to be made by your grandmother according to a particular recipe that she inherited, which is authentic. And you sit there and grind the spices. And if you actually look at the covers of, of Desi books, you know, the Mendi Wale Hearts, the yes. Bindi, the Mango, mm. the Paisley, there is that kind of constant, sort of as if we are not modern dynamic people, as if we are not people who also have things like, um, jobs other than just cooking and, and looking after our children and, and, and going thinking. to the mosque mm. and going to the mosque and being a obedient daughter-in-law those kind of things those stereotypes are still being projected you know all the time it is it's completely exhausting and i think that that also then feeds into this idea of serious literature yes. and i find that a lot of times in general, women's writing is very often bracketed into a non-serious category because they're not necessarily always talking about the universal experience of mankind. And then also when it's something like satire or it's a character like Butterfly or it's a whodunit or it's something like Osenistan, for example, which is not dwelling on the grand tragedies of the South Asian condition. It, do, do you feel like that that kind of writing tends to just be easily dismissed, even though it is just as intelligent and well-observed as anybody else. I think, um, Mina, you know, um, the difficulty is that women's writing has always been looked upon unless you are doing those subjects, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's either sort of chiclet or women's mm -hmm. literature or as if it was a thing in itself. Yeah. Um, the fact is actually that by and large, most of most readers of fiction happen to be women, you know, and they yeah. are, uh, and whatever women write is always also um, slightly, uh, you know, it's it's patron, you know, it's it's looked, it's patronized, you know, by by the the, the canon of by editors, etc. So when a man writes uh, a, a love story, it is a comment on on the human condition. When a woman writes a serious story about love, it's always about it, it's a, it's a romance, you know. So mm. those kind of it, it's not just um, you're right. It's not just it's sexist as well. It is also uh, racist slightly. All those sort of things come in, you know, um, with that and and things which are satirical and lighter in the, in the sense in tone, not in content. Yes. People yes, do exactly. tend to think of those as, as non-serious. Hmm. Hmm. Like, for example, like when I think of P.G. Wodehouse, let's say, who is hilarious, but at the same time, there's a lot of, you know, observations about class and how a certain, a certain, you know, tabka of people live and how, um, yeah, and then again, language and things. So, yeah, I, I, I often think about this. But sort of now, if we were to sort of slide along to talk a little bit about Ruby R, which oh. will be out in March. Okay. And I've had the great privilege. Yes. And I've had the privilege of, of um, reading an advanced copy. And may I just say how much I enjoyed it? Because, you know, it, as always, it is just so trenchantly observed. It's so witty. But at the same time, it's... So it's a, such an empathetic portrayal of a young woman having to make certain choices and thinking that she is empowered and that she is somebody who's, you know, sort of with it and who's got, a, who's, who's passionate about her work. And then at the same time, how susceptible and vulnerable she is to so many kind of outside forces. And I felt that just from the outset, it, you know, if you put aside the satirical or you put aside the, the social slash political observations, it's just a really um, intelligent and, and kind view of how difficult it is to be a young person yeah. also trying to make yeah. your way in the world. Yeah, yeah. So in many ways, um, uh, Mina, it is, it is a social satire, it's a political satire, but at the same time, it's also a coming of age story. Yes, it, it is the story of a journey of a young woman who wants to be independent, who wants to matter in the world, and who, mm. above all, wants to do the right thing as well. Yes. You know, and it's about how, uh, when she embarks on that journey, the kind of things that she has to confront, and how mm. those um, realities uh, impact her decisions and impact her 
worldview and how easy it is how easy it is to start with really good intentions and be waylaid by people who manipulate you and whose narrative is actually uh, only designed to um, entrench themselves and 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 uh, consolidate their own power and how they use you and how you get used in that process without even realizing that you are being used and that you are you yourself have begun to use and abuse others um, mm, you know, the mm. book has also got a lot about social media uh, and how yeah. it is used to yeah. silence people in the subcontinent and how it is used to um, um, bully people and how it is used to intimidate people and threaten them. Um, and that, that I wanted to talk about a great deal because a lot of it impacts young women in particular. Um, yes. Young women in cyberspace are dealt with much more harshly than, than men. Um, and uh, they, the kind of violence that they have to, um, the, the, the threats of violence that they encounter almost every day are also sexual in nature um, yes. and, and very, very frightening. Um, and I did, and I think that's not just confined to Pakistan. I think that's around the world now, and it's a very ugly thing. And I wanted to bring that out into, um, and at the same time, you know, in Pakistan, there is this feeling that we are um, a, a, an Islamic nation, a Muslim nation, where our culture is orati, izzat, karo, etc. And so I wanted to talk mm. about the hypocrisy of that as well. Quite right. And and social media, I think, has been particularly useful in a dark way for mm -hmm. these our kinds of cultures where we are not encouraged. Honesty is not a virtue. And mm -hmm. we were talking about Rak Rakao and that whole idea of certain protocols for certain occasions. But mm -hmm. it also then lends for an incredibly dishonest kind of interaction with people. And the Internet has given so many people this anonymity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because yeah. they, they're can't be accountable. There's no way to hold anybody responsible for hate speech mm. or, you know, like you said, threats of violence mm. online. And there's there's no redress. Mm. No, there for... isn't. And so it's a kind of double-edged sword because in some ways it has also mm. empowered women to speak, you know, and to to uh, to express their views. And <clears throat> I see, for instance, in the Aurat March, uh, a very healthy and positive outcome of all of that. But in the reaction to the Aurat March, you also see the ugly forces, you know, and how on social media it plays out. And um, I, I get very... Um, upset and disappointed um, but I then I remind myself of something that um, uh, in Tizar Hussain the great short story writer mm -hmm. who passed away um, about I think a year or two ago once told me you know he was a um, he was a migrant he had come uh, from um, Lucknow I think uh, or UP mm -hmm. certainly um, after partition and he'd made Lahore his home and so he observed it very carefully because it was a new place for him and he told me once you know when he was almost 90 years old he said to me um, that there I have noticed he said we have two things here and he mentioned talked about them as developments that he had seen and he said one was the rise of the mullah the power of the mullah in the last mm. 40 years 30 40 years mm. and he said strangely enough he said the other is the rise of women and i said to him surely mm -hmm. that's a contradiction mm. and he mm. said that's it that is the dialectic and the future of pakistan will be decided between these two forces wow that's mm. a very challenging binary <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Because, you know, the thing is, the thing is that Pakistan is also a modern country. It is developing very fast. There is a lot of dynamism in people. There is a lot of desire to get on in the world. There is a desire to connect with the rest of the world. And um, mm -hmm. that's not just confined to women. It's also with men. But with women, now that more women are being educated, more women are coming into the workforce. So, you know, that the old social structures are challenged, therefore. Yes. Um, and and uh, um, uh, with with people wanting to be part of the world, the 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 vision of uh, uh, of the mullah is a static one. You know, you, the yes. society doesn't change. Those values have to stay as they always were. The woman has to be in the house. 
she has to look mm. after the children she has to do parda she can't go out right um but the socio economic realities are such that those things cannot happen any longer right because yes. with so much okay. with so much inflation etc women have to come out we women have to earn women have to be part of the uh, of the uh, um economic life of this country social mm. and economic life of this country and as we are seeing in politics also in social service yeah. you know in in if you look at um at the ics exams so many women now participate uh yes. and and do well and do very well and and go on to hold important jobs etc um and so you know there are forces at work uh in the world which you can't hold back um and, and that so and yes. there will be you know there is a clash therefore and a mm -hmm. lot of the hatred and this and the, and the spewing of uh, out of all this kind of intimidatory talk and and bullying is a sign of people uh being panicked by that yes quite right and also it's it's a lot of work for women to have to do on so yes. many fronts yes and i also and and i feel like in the novel also there are so many dynamic young women who yes. are bright and who are focused and who are motivated and who are very brave also yes because absolutely and what i really loved for example about ruby is that she is and in a way ruby's family is like every family it's almost like the every man where they are honest they're honest upright folks who work hard and who are wanting you know their children's lives to be better than theirs and you yes. and in able in in order to do that you know education is very important and having a vision yes. is important and ruby yes. has all of these wonderful ambitions and a plan and a sense of responsibility towards her family and she you know she wants to do well so she can look after her parents and, and not, the other thing that you forgot is that they are also law abiding yes you know they are law abiding and they and and they just want you know the the fruit of their own hard work quite right and i feel like in the world that ruby then has to enter in order to achieve all of these things is a very harsh one and she is really an innocent mm -hmm. in so many ways even mm -hmm. though you know she's able to study abroad and she has those privileges that mm -hmm. one would imagine and i feel like that's that's a very um insightful comment on how a lot of times um this whole conversation about women taking you know taking charge or trying to sort of you know um take control of their lives we often over ascribe power to them mm -hmm. because just because you have an education or just because you have a job or you wear your jeans doesn't yeah. mean that now automatically you are somebody who can deal with all the situations and who can slay all the dragons she's why yeah, is she quite mean, vulnerable in many ways yeah and that's what i wanted to bring about in the book is at the end of the day it's a patriarchy you know and yeah. the patriarchy is alive and well and it destroys young women you know it the idea is for it to use and 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 cast aside you know mm. and and um that is what um a ruby senses in a way which is why she's a feminist because she understands these things but when she mm. becomes emotionally involved and when she's in it in the thick of it she loses mm. her uh, moral compass and in mm. i wanted to talk in the book about how people manip people in power manipulate narratives and manipulate the minds of young people to make them yes. believe that they are on the same side as them whereas yes. in fact they have always the only agenda that they have is to consolidate their own power and to use these people um yes. and uh, you know all of the the so called um um uh, the the slogans that they raise about equality and justice mm -hmm. etc choice and choice there is no choice there is no justice there is no equality it's only a kind of window dressing uh, yes. so that certain people can remain in power certain um uh people can carry on accruing more power more money more uh and more unaccountability you know that is the thing um and um yeah so that's what ruby is up against but she doesn't really understand it and in the book there are three young women you mentioned that they are young women so there's uzma there's yes. ruby 
and mm. there's Farah. And all three of them make slightly different decisions. Yes. And their lives, therefore, all have different outcomes because of mm. those particular decisions that they make. Um, and in fact, they are, you know, I wanted to talk also about how much, as you said, you don't have choice. How much choice do you mm. really have in a system like that? Um, and how much choice do, you know, does a young girl when confronted with a, with a really powerful system, because yes. Seth embodies that system. How yes. much power does she actually have? When you say that, you know, at the end of the day, it was her choice, it was her choice. How much exactly. choice did she have? Uh, you could have said no, you could have said yes, but there really isn't, no, absolutely. And I also, it's intriguing to me, and as a, in terms of, as, as a writer, how did you decide to make the choice to kind of turn this satirical, um, observation to politics as opposed to it just being a story about you know it could have been a different in setting so why this one i have written it in different settings i have written about uh you know people's uh options in 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 uh, the butterfly i've written it in um um the end of innocence as well i talked about <clears throat> you know uh the impact personal decisions have on people's lives uh, and how everything actually at the end of the day is political. You know, even in Butterfly, mm -hmm. it's the reason why it has an impact on you is because the social is also political, right? You recognize yes. so much of it. Mm -hmm. So when, for example, um, she is talking about um, the difficulty of, um, you know, of going out or of um, uh, when, when there is a, a, a protest march or how she feels that she can't wear sleeveless any longer. She is worried about how her, uh, you know, the Taliban might take over when they had that kind of fear that the Taliban mm. might take over, how it will impact her own life. She's only thinking about that, but that's when the personal becomes political, right? Quite um, Mm -hmm. Can I wear my sleeveless and go out onto the street? That too is a political decision, right? It impacts your life. Mm -hmm. um, in this mm -hmm. case, I was, you know, because so much of what we've seen recently has been about word politics. I did want to write a little bit about it. And particularly, I wanted to write about how people are polarized deliberately, you know, yes. how these divisions are created in society, how it's all, you know, certain people are othered, you know, how, yes. um, how um, narratives take a life of their own, how they are put mm -hmm. out so carefully, you know, Falana, Falana, what is the story that we are going to talk about? We're going to talk about only one thing, which is one point agenda, which is corruption. You know, there yes. is a whole universe aside mm. from corruption. But we cannot go there because we are only going to talk about this because this has been decided up high, you know, mm -hmm. and how we all become foot soldiers of that. And how even friends of yours that you knew up until yesterday and went out and had coffee with and had dinner with, etc. I'm now beginning to tell you that I am opposed to you because you said you criticized a particular policy there. And yeah. corruption you want the corruption back? And you say, you know, no, I was just saying how the price mm -hmm. of petrol has gone so high. And this, you corruption, <laughs> you know? Yes. And, it's, and it's actually really frightening that this kind of binary is established as a deliberate political strategy. Yeah. Where then, and you know, back in the olden, old days with the Greeks, a politician who indulged in that kind of rhetoric was a bad politician and you were supposed to kind of rely on logic and arguments not opinions and beliefs and playing on people's emotions to yeah so there is, a, there is a divorce from we've all divorced from fact and it's all about emotion and how you feel and it's not about so you know trump felt that he'd lost that he'd won the election he felt it yes. you know yeah. and that is why <laughs> And, and that and is why it became, you know, such a big thing because it was completely divorced from reality. But he yeah. said, I feel it. I know I won it, you know? And yeah. so at the end of the day, that's what matters. And all those people who came out to protest also felt the same thing because they had been led to feel that, right? And here too, 
I mean, if you, you know, the lack of competence is, is uh, mm. you know, when you talk about that, it's deflected and you told corruption, why can't you have, why can't you also have competence? Why is it a choice between corruption and competence? You know? Yes, and who is and who is deciding that it can only be either or? Either Why? or, when exactly, exactly. Why can't we <laughs> have a, 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 a non-corrupt but competent government? Why yes, can't we, we have want- that? Yes, who says we can't have all the things? <laughs> and why is it deliberate? All, even a little what? bit of competence, even a little bit would be very nice. <laughs> do you think that this is also very easy to do? Because if you leech nuance from any kind of conversation like that, it just makes people in power, it makes it easier for them mm-hmm. to manipulate. To, mm-hmm. to manipulate and then to drive the agenda so that nobody talks about them. They're constantly mm-hmm. talking about the things, you know, being distracted by ridiculous things, you know. So, for example, corruption, corruption, corruption. Who has been in power for the last 70 years? Non-stop. Mm, mm. <laughs> but you know, dams. <laughs> yeah, I can't and, then, that. And, and frighteningly, this is what happens all over the world with the media, is that some terrible thing will be happening, but then some really idiotic thing will be flung in our faces to distract us from the actual matter at hand. Yes, but in other places, sometimes there is reckoning. Whereas here, there mm. never seems to be any reckoning. Mm-hmm. But you know, and that is another thing I wanted to write mm-hmm. about in, in, in yeah. Ruby, um, how some people get away with murder almost, you know, there's no accountability. Yeah. But at the minute a woman steps out of line for even this much, there's immediate accountability, you know, mm-hmm. and how Thank also, you. uh, how the powerful are always protected and how mm-hmm. the people who don't have power are always held accountable. Absolutely. No, quite right. And yes, I was just going to think something. <laughs> I lost it. I had something really good to ask you and I lost it. Okay. Raza, how are we for time? Let me just check. We have a question. So mm. I feel like at this point, we've had a rather nice chat. And would you like to take a question, Moni, from sure. the audience? Sure, sure. Okay. So Zen Khalid wants to ask now there's no question mark at the end of this so be prepared (laughs) what would be your advice for the political writers in pakistan keeping in view the present political situation of the country where opposition or criticism to policies are blamed to be anti-nationalistic rhetoric or foreign agendas yeah this is a good observation because the novel does have does bring up that issue also that are you a true patriot or not Yes, yes. So everybody who agrees with you is a patriot and everybody who doesn't agree mm-hmm. with you is a is a traitor, you know, and, and who hands out those certificates are the ones in power. I would, my, um, then my advice to you would be to try and be as truthful as you can, um, because mm-hmm. that's something which is the truth and facts are the, the things which are now most contested, because everybody is allowed to feel and everybody is allowed to base their um uh, uh, their worldview on emotion and on mm. opinions. But in fact, there is such a thing as facts and we as novelists and as writers have to keep a grip on that. It's very, very important um, that when we write, we talk about what is actually true. And you know, mm-hmm. your work will be read and appreciated uh, uh, if when people, uh, for me certainly, even in small things, you know, what I have noticed with even the Diary of a Social Butterfly is that the reason why people like it is because they recognize the truth in it. Mm-hmm. They recognize, mm-hmm. you know, like maybe ye you actually, you know, that when uh, you are giving a lecture mm-hmm. to somebody else about, you know, being fair, etc., and and being good and all that, and when your uh, maid comes and says, "I want to rise," you say, "Le." <laughs> exactly so uh and if your writing is not truthful then then it will not strike a chord and i think that that's something that's very important to consider because a lot of times when people think of fiction writing they think that it's not true because it's made up so Mm. if it comes from the imagination then truth is non-fiction 
whereas that's not the case at all no 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 let me see hmm we haven't got any other questions so if we if you are satisfied with this conversation moni i, I think that we can call it very thank good. you very and much nina so call it a day uh, so uh, the impeccable integrity of ruby r inshallah will be coming here I, i don't have an exact date for its publication but hopefully before june certainly secondly mm-hmm. the podcast is coming out tomorrow and it's called brown dog and it will be available on spotify and on apple and on um, itunes and please do tune in and listen and thank you very Wonderful. much lena thank you very much raza and i hope that um all of us will be well and safe and happy in the coming year oof amen and amen so both languages um, thank you everybody um, for joining us and we will see you next time on the ideas conclave bye bye, bye. Thank you.